And welcome to Heartbeat Alaska. I'm Jeannie Green. Thank you so very much for joining us. Today, we continue our series on Southeast Alaska, revisiting Sitka once again. And thank you so much for the many phone calls and emails we received for copies of this series. Everything has a history. This desk has a history. My set has a history. I have a history, which began in Sitka, Alaska. As a little girl, I was born in Sitka. My mother and dad, Mabel and Jean Blashford, raised us right on the edge of Bjorka Street near the National Cemetery. Our home is gone there, but we have fabulous memories of Sitka. We'll be back with historical Sitka right after this. Heartbeat Alaska is pleased to announce a brand new official hotel. We're brought to you now by Millennium Alaskan Hotel, the official hotel of Heartbeat Alaska, and... Heartbeat Alaska is also brought to you by Frontier Airlines. Thank you, Frontier Airlines, for getting Heartbeat Alaska airborne. Hi, I'm Mark from Scan Home, and we are proud to sponsor Heartbeat Alaska. Scan Home, serving all of Alaska's home and office furnishing needs. Thank you, Scan Home, for making Heartbeat Alaska possible. Heartbeat Alaska is brought to you in part by Brown's Electric Lighting Gallery. Thank you, Brown's Electric, for your generous support of Heartbeat Alaska. Welcome back. Alaska, being the largest state in the Union, is huge. Every point on this state is fascinating with its own history, its own personality its own look, its own feel and smell in Southeast Alaska. When I think of Sitka and Juneau, I think of the smell of the ocean and the wonderful seaweed. I think of big, tall trees and boats. If you haven't visited Southeast Alaska, I encourage you to please visit Sitka, one of the most beautiful towns in Alaska, a town with a history that goes back into time, a time when Clinkett's walked the land, and then visitors arrived. Visitors who changed the lives of all of the people in this area. Welcome to Sitka, Alaska, Shiatika. Clinkets have been here for over 10,000 years. The Clinkets have never been dominated. Everybody who has lived here has coexisted. But this coexistence came at a high cost. For the Clinket people of Shiatika, the late 18th century was the beginning of the end an end to the peaceful way of life they had known forever. History says that Sitka was discovered by the Russian Vitus Bering Expedition in 1741, but the many faces of Shiatika say otherwise. For over 10,000 years, the Clinket people of Southeast Alaska have lived from the land and waters, respecting the animals, respecting each other. In 1799, manager for the Russian-American company Alexander Baranov seized the opportunity to harvest an abundance of sea otter pelts whose furs brought a high price on the market and established a settlement in the area, naming it New Archangel, a fort known as Baranov's Castle and the St. Michael's Readout Trading Post were built. 
thus beginning the years of fur trade amongst many nations. Agreements between natives and Russians led to the Klinket people burning down the fort and looting the warehouse in 1802. Two years later, the Russians retaliated by destroying the Klinket fort in the historic battle of Sitka. This would be the last major stand by the Tlingit people against the Russians, with the Tlingits evacuating the area for the next 20 years. The Russian records refer to this large wall, this high fence, as a stockade, and the census and the maps refer to it that as well. Fearing further retaliation, the Russians built a wall that stretched the length of the town and along it, a blockhouse that still stands today. The records state that the Russians built this to keep the Klinkets out and to protect themselves from the Klinkets. Because you see, right here in the middle, they had a blockhouse. The Russians stored their ammunition in the bottom and they posted a watch around the clock. They knew the Klinkets would return. They just didn't know when. It may have given them the false idea that it would keep the Klinkets out, but it also kept the Russians in because they were bordered on this side by the ocean. With the aid of this miniature scale model of Sitka, 1867, Dr. Orion Drenslow, director of the Isabel Miller Museum in Sitka, Alaska, takes us on a journey through the streets of New Archangel. Now this was a Russian psaltery. This is where they dried all of their fish. By 1808, Sitka was the capital of Russian Alaska, with Alexander Baranov serving as governor. It became the largest seaport on the North Pacific coast, exporting mainly furs to European and Asian markets, as well as salmon, lumber, and ice to American markets. In addition to this being a busy seaport town, we have a shipbuilding industry. As early as 1811, the Russian-American company established a shipbuilding industry here. They actually went to Finland and hired some expert shipbuilders to come here. But I think one of the most amazing things about this shipbuilding industry is most of us who live here today are unaware of the history of it. The Russian-American company had these shipbuilders build 60 steamships between 1811 and 1863. It wasn't until Alexander Baranov left Sitka that the Klinkit people returned to their original site and built their homes on what is now known as Katlian Street. 1829, Elizabeth Wrangell accompanies her husband here to Sitka. He has been a, in, invited to be the chief manager of the Russian American Company. She's a baroness, very well educated, very wealthy, and high society. Now she realizes that there are very important men that are in to Sitka every day coming on all these ships from around the world. So after she has the castle completely done, she asked for a shipload of exquisite furnishing. She detailed the tapestries, eight-foot mirrors that she wanted, and we have one picture over here on an exhibit of the interior of Baranov's castle. Of course, it's all done in European style at that time. After she has the castle completely redone, she initiates ballroom dancing and dinner dances on a nightly basis for these captains of the ships. 
in 1844, you have a very important man that was sent here, and his name is Bishop Innocence, or Father Van Minenoff. And his reason for coming here, of course, was to build the very first cathedral outside of Russia in the headquarters, as they called it, New Archangel of the Russian American Company. Now, he invited the shipbuilders to actually build St. Michael's Cathedral. The bishop did not have a home. So once again, our shipbuilders built this exquisite building across the street known as the Bishop's House. And this is another one of the beautiful legacies left by our Lutheran shipwrights and the Russian American Company. Each week, Heartbeat Alaska brings you great stories from all over the state. And we couldn't do it without the generous support of Frontier Flying Service. Frontier gets our camera crews where they need to go. So whenever you see a Frontier plane, give them a wave. Say hi from Northland. You might just be on Heartbeat Alaska. Frontier Flying Service, covering Alaska for over 50 years. The moment you enter the doorway at the Millennium Hotel, another world surrounds you. It's a world of friendly faces and cordial service. It's a place of great taste and great tastes. The Millennium Hotel is a haven of relaxation and personal restoration, of attentive service and attention to details. But at the end of the day, we won't read you a bedtime story. Although, would you be surprised if we did? should have been a turning point for the Tlingit people of Sitka when the United States purchased Alaska from the Russians for $7.2 million. When you look at the records of the transfer ceremony and what William Seward had originally drawn up, the American natives, the Tlingits, were actually guaranteed in the paperwork to be citizens of the United States. However, we're all aware that did not happen. It wasn't until the early 1900s that the first Clinket man would make U.S. history. In 1915, David P. Howard was one of the first Alaska natives to receive citizenship in the United States of America. The 1880s was a time of tremendous discrimination and of a people in the Clinket culture. And as we look at it from our perspective today, one can only develop an immense admiration for the strength, the determination, the commitment, the physical attributes and strength that the Tlingit people had in order to have survived. There's gold, and it's haunting and haunting. It's luring me on as of old. Yet it isn't the gold that I'm wanting so much as just finding the gold. It's the great big broad land way up yonder. It's the forest where silence has lease. It's the beauty that fills me with wonder. It's the stillness that fills me with peace. Today, the streets of Sitka are alive with history, reminders of days gone by. From the days of the Russians to the prospectors who came looking for gold, the charms of yesteryear surrounds this city. Yeah. To 
visitors. These hand-carved structures are little more than beautiful statues that grace the land. But to the Clinkets of Sitka, they are storybooks with each totem representing another chapter in the lives of the Clinket people. Now, a few of the people that we would just like to lift up because time permits doing just a few. Rudolph Walton was one of the first graduates of what was then known as the Sitka Industrial School for Boys, or today it's known as Sheldon Jackson College. Rudolph Walton was, became a noted silver carver and actually owned one of the first courier or the tourist shops in Sitka during the 1880s. He worked hard to preserve his Clinket culture, and he also was able to successfully balance his roots with the Caucasian culture that was here at the same time. Another very important leader of some of the first people was Peter Simpson, and he was an extraordinary boat builder and ship builder. And when we're talking about education, due to his foresight, his granddaughter, a Clinkett elder today, Isabel Brady, has become one of today's most respected Clinkett elders. Peter Simpson is my grandfather, and he's called the uh, father of the Alaska Native land claims because land was very dear to him. He's also called the founder of the Alaska Native Brotherhood because there was a group of them that felt very strongly that if they could work together and then they'd have more strength and be able to accomplish much more. They all thought the fact that education is very, very important for us to We'll be able to do whatever we wanted to do in this world. And the Alaska Native Brotherhood was very strong on education. You're late, Dad. I know, I know. I'm almost done with my homework. Yeah? Tess is mad at you. She's mad at me about? You said you would play basketball with her. She said she'll never speak to you again. <laughs> Parents that are involved with their kids are more likely to help keep their kids away from drugs. <laughs> Nothing but that. <laughs> are you traveling to Anchorage for education or health care? The Alaska Family Hospice is your home in the city. Located one and a half blocks from the Alaska Native Medical Center, Alaska Family Hospice offers fully equipped apartments. Housekeeping services, shuttle service, Medicaid payments, grocery shopping service, or cook your own native food right in your apartment. Well, I've been coming here for the uh, last three years, and all the time I come here, we don't, it's like a home away from home. For total comfort, affordability, and safety, come on home to the Alaska Family Hospice, your home in the city. The presence of the Clinket people in Sitka, Alaska, not only add to the history, this is their home. These are the people that inhabited this beautiful area far longer than anyone could ever imagine. And today, they've folded their lives into the Western culture in a way that makes this city one of the most outstanding in the world. The Clinket culture is here to stay. Perhaps one of the most visited sites in Sitka is the Clinket Community House, which stands at the entrance of the old Sitka, the Indian village. Within this building can be found a living culture 
and pieces to a past that has been forgiven, but not forgotten. Long ago, a clan house of this size would house nine to ten families of one particular clan. The big man of the house would reside behind the house screen here. And according to uh, our society, being very much a caste society, would depend on how closely you got to sleep to the fire. This is what we call a modern rendition of a Thlingit clan house. The house posts are traditional, the tiered seating, we have a covered fire pit in the center, and of course a smoke hole. The house screen is also traditional. Behind these doors would traditionally be the quarters for the big man of the house and his family, being the highest status. Traditionally it would be a circular opening with the hide. This emblem here at this crest represents the entire Tlingit nation. It's traditional in our clan houses to when you come in to tell you the story about this building. This building is a place for gathering, for unity. The eagle and the raven depicted here are very, very similar. And this particular artist wanted to share with people the, the unity and how close we truly are. On the right hand side here we have the eagle. The only difference from the raven is the very top part of the black beak. You can see how it points down to a sharp curve as an eagle's does. Now on the raven's side, the raven's top part of the black beak is very gradual and the mouth is often open. Under each of these moieties are over 30 clans. Under the raven clan you would find the frog, which is Kiksadi, the coho, people, uh, my clan, Dachdentan, sea pigeon. Under the eagle side, you would find uh, Kaguantan, the wolf that are here, the Chukanedi, which is the bear eagle clan. So these two together, back to back, have another meaning. Uh, this design came about, I was told, in about the 1940s, called the lovebirds. And it's called the lovebirds because that's what's required for marriage. Uh, eagle marries raven, raven marries eagle. The spirit face in the center is here to welcome you. The arms on, the, uh, on either side, outstretched, tell all that they are welcome here. And I was also told by an elder that there's another, there could be another meaning with the spirit face. Long ago, I was told that there was a peacekeeper. And in some potlatches, when they would dance, he would dance with his arms closed. And at the end of the dance, if his arms were still closed, there would be war. If his arms were open at the end, that meant there would be peace. So I think that's a special meaning for this building. Uh, I love to talk to people that come in and view it, whether they're a visitor or attending here for a conference. They, they say it's just, it really has a neat feeling in here. It has a spiritual feeling, a healing feeling, and a place where people can come together and have a meeting of minds. Uh, it's really an honor to be a part of this place. This house screen is one of the largest in the Pacific Northwest. It's approximately 20 feet high by 40 feet wide. It's constructed out of red cedar. Uh, Will Burkhart had about 40 people helping him. And it was done in sections, large enough just to fit in within the clan house doors. These are our traditional colors. The green comes from oxidized copper, the black from charcoal, and the red is from uh, what I am told the base that all paints were used long ago is with salmon eggs. The oil would bind to the wood and thus seal it in. These are what we call dance staffs. These are used as timekeepers. The men would hold them and shake them along to the beat of the drum. Once again, we are showing the balance. One is an eagle, one is the raven. These dance staffs were made by Wayne Price, uh, another very uh, special carver to us. And he has a very special story, even the hair that was donated. Uh, people that had come into his shop while he was making these, uh, once they heard that these were going to represent the Shikikuan Nakahiri, uh, they gladly donated their hair with blessings. Long ago, this would have been uh, slave hair, uh, which would have shown a, a matter of, of status to a clan house, to a clan. This is a deerskin drum, otherwise known as a travel drum. Long ago, when visitors would come to a clan house, they would be in a canoe. They would be from another village. 
and they would play their coming in song as they were coming in on the waters, letting us know. This bar just came to the community house here uh, just last October. This is an icon of the era when the Russians were still occupying Sitka. There was a gate uh, along the fence. The Russians occupied one side, the Tlingit on the other. This bar represents protection. It represents something solid from the past for the Kiksadi people. This particular bar was uh, originally, uh, before it came here, it was belonged to Al Perkins, who was our Kiksadi chief. He passed away here a little while back. But this house, since it's been almost 200 years since we've had a clan house of this size, uh, full size here in Sitka, uh, it's for all the people of Sitka. Thank you everyone for joining us for Heartbeat Alaska. It's a pleasure to be invited into your home. We thank you so much for allowing us to share our native people, our cultures, who we are. Some of the most fascinating nations in the world. God bless every single one of you and join me again next week for more natives from Alaska. We'll see you then. Okay.